France and I live now in the UK and I work uh, with the Airbus Foundation. I actually have been an educator as well, not a teacher, uh, but an educator in informal learning environments. So mostly in science centers, science museums, and other types of non-school environments. And, and, oh wow, wonderful. And today I, um, I work, I have my own company, I work with several science centers in Europe and beyond, and also work with the Airbus Foundation to build new collaborations around their resources. Just before we start, who here has heard of the Airbus Foundation? Please raise your hand if you've heard before of the Airbus Foundation. Okay, we have one person, congratulations. Uh, who here have heard of the Airbus Company? The Airbus Company, okay, we have quite a good number of people. The company is quite famous, famous for its products, for its planes, for its components to go to space. Uh, but the foundation is, is much less known in the education area and we would like this to, to change because we believe that, we, that the foundation has things to offer for all kinds of educators, for teachers and also other kinds of educators. Um, the, the Airbus Foundation has different area of work. The first one is uh, about um, supporting the people who move when there is a disaster, when they go in a disaster relief, when there is an emergency somewhere in the world. Uh, the foundation uh, offers them transportation, planes, to quickly be able to be on site and to support them. This is one part of the work. A new work that the foundation started a few years ago is a part we call youth development and which is directly linked to education. That is education and development in all kind of different directions. Obviously the foundation is very linked to the Airbus company but it's a distinct entity, a non-profit that is focusing on flight and space, aerospace uh, and trying to engage young adults with aerospace on topics on knowledge, but also on skills, uh, including soft skills linked with flight and space. So, this we are going to try to make this workshop as interactive or even participatory as possible. So, before we start, I would like you to just maybe wake up a little bit, and for this, I'm going to ask you to stand up, please. And. I'm going to take my phone just to measure time and for the next two minutes, just as a very short exercise to wake up, I will ask you for the next two minutes not to say a word. Please, let's say we are not, you are not allowed to speak. And I would like you to order yourselves, your bodies, in the room by order of height, of size. You have 60 seconds to do so. Go! You have 30 seconds left. You have 10 seconds left. Check for the last five seconds. Does it seem okay? Thank you very much. It's been 60 seconds. You are ordering a rather good ways. There are not too many mistakes. We know we know in all experiments there, there are some imprecisions, it's it's normal. But here it seems a quite good one. So let's go a step further. And for the next exercise, once again, please not a word. You have 60 seconds to organize yourself in the room by order of age. And you are allowed, if you'd like, to lie about your age. No. Ooh. 
You have 30 seconds. Are you all okay with this? That's fantastic, you even have 15 seconds left. So, you are ordered by age. This is obviously just a little warm up, there is no content here. Although, obviously, as an educator, you can also still see here the very beginning, the very, very beginning of some things that could become interesting if we were going deeper about collaboration, about building a common language. We, we, we were seeing some very interesting communication issues and solving here, about leadership as well, and management. You, you, you saw some, some there, there were some difficult moments, some very short moments where it took a bit more time than you expected. I could see the, see the tension in some of you at some moments. So we, we can use this as an icebreaker, as a warm-up exercise, usually when we want to work on collaboration and sometimes on creativity. Before we go further, I would like you now to form small groups, groups of three to four people, preferably with people you don't know yet, so you might have a chance to know them a little bit better. And when you have found your group, first let's find the group. You have like, take just 10 seconds to make the groups. Groups of three or four. You can talk now, yes. It's gonna be easier, sorry. You can breathe. Three or four, yes. That's... All right. So, I consider, I consider you have your groups now, and I will ask you just to split in, the, in groups. You can sit down somewhere if you like, you can walk somewhere else if you like. And just to start knowing each other, I would like every person in the group to share with the other person in their group three things. What is your name? What are you teaching? And what is the last thing you have created yourself? What is the last thing you have created? It can be a lesson plan, it could be a dish or a dessert, it can be an idea, it can be whatever. The last thing you have created yourself. You have five minutes, or you don't need the five. You can take three minutes just to share names, teaching, and last creation. Join some groups, please feel free. If you prefer to stay a bit in the back, you're welcome as well.
take 30 seconds to end. It's, it's quite dear to me personally and to us with the Abbas Fandai Foundation. We, are, we have really shifted in terms of the kind of resources we provide from resources telling about the, the jobs, the technicalities, the knowledge, the physics, the mechanics uh, of, of our planes, of the components for space, to more global questions trying to require also interdisciplinarity and soft skills such as collaboration, creativity, problem solving skills, because we find out that with the jobs we need in the Abbas company, these are the skills we need the most, that we are struggling with sometimes. You can find very good engineers, but find extraordinary engineers who are also extraordinary collaborators and creative problem solvers, that becomes quite tricky. So we are focusing also a lot on, on this part. And obviously our main question at the Abbas Foundation is, how can we engage our students with aerospace? Students who can be young children, eight year old, who can be young adults, 15, 16, even 17 or 18 years old. And obviously you're all teachers, so you're using various tools, activities, to engage them already with flight or space at large. Could you just say a few of them? What activities do you already use or do you already know to engage students with flight or space? We make model planes. Model planes, wonderful. What else? Yes. The Zero Gravity European Space Agency and Space Race Front. That, that's a great idea. Not, are you using this right now? Right now, no, but with students. With, with students. Wonderful. Any other activities or tools that you are using or that you know that you could use if you wanted to take a flight or space related topics? It's almost the same, we know each other. So. But uh, I use also parabolic flights, you know, to, to explain ballistic trajectories and as examples and triggers tons of questions about how you maneuver the plane, especially. Yes. So, maneuvering planes, ballistic trajectories, what else do, did you already use or did you know? Uh, we use augmented reality things uh, about uh, space vehicles. Demonstration. Great. Augmented reality for demonstrations, and you also heard here. Hello. <laughs> My students can uh, do animation about space and what is it? Animation? They can do, what, what kinds of animation do they do? Um, animation on sketch. Okay. With, with sketch on sketch. And I heard someone say rockets, I wasn't sure. Yes, let's see. this is a quite common activity as well, rocket launching. It can go from paper rockets to water bottle rockets to really small models of rockets with powder uh, that can go quite far away. I have done some myself years ago. Um, so, yes, there are plenty of ways to, to engage with flight, with space. The Foundation already has lots of partnerships, local partnerships with uh, companies, associations, mostly NGOs and, and non-profit bodies who are organizing activities on every country. The foundation has to try, uh, tries to have a global impact. But we, the new challenges for the foundation were, can we build something that is global instead of having lots of tiny local, not instead, we, we see they, they are still looking to have these tiny local actions, but can we also add to this a global thing that could be used by anyone, any educator, any school, wherever they are in the world, and that could be a resource for them. Something that could be useful for different age group, with the same global approach, with various resources for the various ages, and something that was very focused on the creative approach, enabling collaboration, enabling interdisciplinarity or even transdisciplinarity. And the answer is a work in progress. Obviously the foundation started something one year ago, 
that we call the Amos Foundation Discovery Space, that is based on learning by design, meaning we engage students to discover things and learn by creating, designing different elements, uh, where, uh, where, whether it is designing do-it-yourself objects, low-tech objects, or is it online, on a computer, designing a, a 3D design for space, for example. So, I'm going to go on the website right now, and so if I, yes, you can see it. If I go on the website right now, you can see the first page, Amos Foundation Discovery Space, wonderful. And we now have only two topics. Science of Flights, which you, which you see here, is uh, one that has just been launched and you have only a few resources, just some videos for now. The one that we launched one year ago, which is still a work in progress, we're still adding new things, changing things, and we're happy to change things also according to your needs, is called Mission to the Moon. Uh, very briefly, you know, we went to the moon 50 years ago. You might be aware that we would like now to go to the moon, that the European Space Agency has launched uh, two years ago already and announced, us and announced they wanted to go back to the moon, because if we want to explore space further away, if we want to settle on Mars, on other planets, other bodies, we need to learn how to stay long for a long time in space. During the first uh, Apollo 11 mission, uh, of course, they, they stayed on the moon less than 24 hours. Now if we want to stay six months, one year, several years, we need to be able to live and sustain there. And for, for, for this, for exploring space, for going to Mars and staying on Mars, first we need a laboratory which is close, like the moon, to test and learn how to live there for a long time. So this is the main narrative behind the mission to the moon. And the approach that has been chosen by the Airbus Foundation is quite simple, but very design-oriented. Meaning, you will have the first text explaining why we should go there, and then you will have some challenges. You'll see them in a few seconds. These four challenges you have seen here is, if we want to go and sustain on the moon, we have to learn how to go there, to fly there. We have to learn how to uh, where to live, in which kind of house. We have to learn how to live, how to breathe, how to eat. And we have to learn how to move and to move ourselves on the moon. So each of them, let's take the first one, will be comprised of first a set of small videos. These are very short videos, 90 seconds long, that will just present the main scientific challenges for example, the one in the middle will be about the trajectory. If we want to go from Earth to the Moon, obviously the trajectory will not be a straight line. So how do we calculate it? How do we know which kind of trajectory we need to go from the Earth to the Moon? I can show you, for example, the, the, one of the most simple videos, which is this one. Uh, will I have sound? I just, just looking for the sound mini jack. We'll do without the sound. Oh, we can try this. It's exciting. Let's try. Just a minute. Extremely exciting. So now the mini jack is in place, but we have no sound. So I will. You will not hear it. But what they present here is in a very simple terms. Enough anymore. It will slow you down. To help air get out of the way, 
Your rocket needs to be aerodynamic, so super thin and smooth. Only then can you go fast enough to leave Earth. So as you can see, this video is very short. It doesn't give long explanations. This is up to the educators, but also up to the students to dig. What do you mean by aerodynamic? It seems like, is it necessarily more slim or not more slim? Can we go more into details? And they have to search for this. Uh, so to, and one way to explore this will be to see how it translates into challenges of things to do. So here we have three videos, one about going to the moon, one about the trajectory, and one about the landing. And then you can respond to these challenges by building your own moon rocket. And for this you have three options. And that's why I have to tell you that this platform has been done in partnership with Autodesk. Who is here has already heard about Autodesk? Two, three. Who has already used something called Instructables? So Autodesk is a software company. They have plenty of softwares and, and portals online. And especially they focus a lot on softwares to support people who build things. Instructables is a very classical do-it-yourself portal where you have plenty of free uh, do-it-yourself sheets of experiments, activities, things to build. Uh, and the, so this is the first one you have here on your on the on the left, yes. And if I go there, I will have a link to an activity which should appear in your eyes in a couple of seconds if the internet accepts to work. Yes, wonderful. Uh, and which will tell you all the materials you need. the safety elements, a few el very simple elements of background, and obviously then we go into the next page. And, oops, sorry. 